about how we glorify and magnify your name above all the names of the earth. That there is none like you, O oh God. You have proven yourself worthy of our praise. Time and again, you've forgiven us of our faults, given us another chance to get it right, spared us from death, doom, and destruction. And, oh God, we're grateful for the life that we live today. Lord, I pray now that you would make yourself manifest in this place, that you would speak through these fragile and feeble lips into hearts that are sometimes hardened. Lord, say what needs to be said that we might be what we need to be to do what we've been called to do and to live a life that is acceptable unto you. In the name of the one who died and rose again from the dead, Jesus our Christ, we do pray. And redeemed of the Lord said, Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to um, kind of move quickly tonight into something that uh, God placed on my heart that I believe is in line with who we are as young adults and also with the season that we find ourselves in in this Holy Week. I want to begin by letting you know in just a few weeks um, I get ready to celebrate um, my 43rd birthday. And for those who don't know, that means that Young Adult Ministry just went up a year at Alpha Street Baptist Church. So as long as you're 43 and under, you're a young adult um, in our church. And as always, for me, birthdays are never these big moments of celebration. Um, never really desire a huge party or a lot of accolades, but more of a time of reflection for me. Uh, to kind of sit back and think about where my life is, where the Lord has brought me, and what this next year ought to be. Realizing that every year we cross off of the calendar is one less year we have to live. And that uh, as we reach our late 40s and 50s, we have more behind us than we do ahead of us. And I'm just serious about trying to live the best life I can live, to be the best man of God I can be um, in this stage of my life. So I began thinking about that, uh, where I am at 43, and one of the things I began to appreciate is that the Lord has planted me here at this church family. I cannot tell you how much joy it brings my heart to be part of this body of Christ and to have the opportunity to work out my calling and sharing the word of God with uh, those who gather on a Wednesday night, those who gather on Saturday and Sunday. Um, I literally believe I have one of the best jobs in the world. And you know, it's once said that if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Um, and I'm grateful to God to be where I am at 43. And I sometimes counsel and minister with people who are in their early 20s, mid-20s, going into those early 30s, who are still searching for that place, uh, that place where you've landed and can step on the gas of life and use all the gifts God is giving you and pursue your calling. And that calling doesn't necessarily have to be in church. You can have a calling for the work that you do. But to reach that place where you are joyful, there's nothing worse in the world than having to get up to go do something you don't want to do. Uh, it's one of the worst experiences in life. And I think all of us desire to land in a couple places. One, where we are excited about what we do. Number two, where we're always growing and stretching. You never want to be in a place where you've mastered your context, where all of your gifts have already been used. You want to be in a place where you're always learning new skill sets, learning a new language, learning new ways of doing things all the time. You want to reach a place where we're compensated, amen, for what we do. Uh, let the church say amen. Uh, a amen. Um, you know, I do it for free, but I'm grateful I don't have to. Uh, uh, that we get compensated and can begin making plans um, for retirement years. I don't think any of us want to live and work all the days of our lives. Uh, my predecessors, all the pastors before me, pastored some 40 years in this place and oftentimes joke with our deacons, I'm going to be uh, the shortest tenured pastor in the history of Alpha Street Baptist Church because after 25 years when the Lord says 60, I'm throwing y'all to deuces and I am out of here. I am not going to die in the pulpit. Amen. I'm going to be on the ninth green. I'm going to birdie a hole and the Lord is going to take me home to glory and y'all going to hear about it in the news. He died on the golf course. That's just the way it's going to happen. I am not going to preach, say amen, and roll over and have my funeral in this church. Amen. Um, um, and I think all of us also want to be in that place where we control our own schedule, um, where you work when you have to and you want to, uh, but you're not punching the clock of the nine to five. Um, and as I speak with young adults who are trying to reach that place, one of the things I oftentimes call to mind is some words of advice that one of my mentors uh, Dr. Freddie Haynes down in Dallas, Texas once said to me, uh, hey, y'all know Freddie, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good brother. Freddie said, Howard John, you want to be where you're going to be at 40, 
so you can make your best impression in life. You want to be where you're going to be at 40. Speaking about careers, that when you reach your 40th, you want to be where you're going to be so you can have your greatest impact. What Dr. Haynes tried to press upon me that I share openly with you is that uh, 40 really does present some of the best years of your life. Um, I know that's a shock to y'all who look at 40 and say it's old. But by 40, you've got some things that are a benefit and a blessing. Number one, you've got wisdom that comes through experience, uh, that you've had some life lessons that have taught you some things. And this is not a wisdom you gain in any Ivy League or any classroom, but stuff you've learned because you've been attentive to life. Um, also, by 40, uh, you're still able to have that strength of body so that you can work it out, you can grind it out, you can still go out. It's not as much as you used to, but you can still do it every now and then. Um, because 40 brings the perfect balance of wisdom and strength. Uh, we're getting ready to start our fourth worship service here at the church. And one of the conversations I had with the deacons, they were worried, Pastor, can you preach four times? I said, listen, this is, this is the height of my preaching career right here. I've got the wisdom. I've been preaching 20 years. I've got the strength. If we're going to do four services, now is the time to do it. Let's not wait till I'm 60, because then I'm going to put the youth pastor up every other Sunday, because uh, I can't handle that. Uh, but right now is when, you know, I've got the strength and energy to do it. By 40, you've gotten a lot of stuff out of your system. Um, there ought to be some things that are no longer attractive to you in your 40s, which allow you to be more focused on the calling of God in your life. And I believe David was strangely turning around 40 when he wrote the 25th Psalm. And in the 25th Psalm, David says something to the effect, Lord, don't remember the sins of my youth. The David is able to look back and realize there was some stuff he did that was sinful simply because he was young and dumb. You know, in your early 20s, you don't know that much, uh, but you think you do. And you look back at it when you're 40 and go, whoo, Lord, I can't believe I made it out of that, you know. Um, I, matter of fact, real, real quick, real quick, I, anybody over 40 and over 40 folk, hey, just raise your, be proud of it. It's the new 30, girl. It's the new 30. Okay. How many folk over 40 can look back and say you were kind of dumb at 20? You were kind of dumb at 20, right? Didn't know that much. Uh, but there's stuff we get out of our system. But 40 does not mean that you've matured. Um, because a lot of us know some 40-year-olds who don't fit that category. Um, 40 and still living at home with mama. 40 and still dependent upon parents to pay bills. 40 and still out at the club in the middle of the week. Um, you, know, you know, ain't nothing worse than a 40-year-old in the club on Wednesday night, you know. Just still trying to get it in. Um, you know, 40 and still chasing down every new opportunity of love and desire and new romance and new relationships don't have that commitment in their life. My dad had a saying, and I want to pass it on to you. He basically suggested that age can't really gauge maturity because age only tell, age is what he said, age doesn't tell you how far someone has traveled, just how long they've been on the road, right? And it's possible to be 40 plus, you've been on the road a long time, but still not have progressed um, to that place of maturity in your life. And I began thinking about that in reflection over the life of Jesus. And I'm going to ask a favor for a real quick second. I need everyone in here who's between 30 and 35 to stand. If you're between 30 and 35. I want you to remain standing for just a moment. All of you who are standing, Jesus was your age when he changed the world. His ministry begins at 30. He's crucified around 35, 33. Think about it. At your age, Jesus changed the world. God chose to use a young adult to change the world. What you think about that as you remain seated? 30 to 35. That's amazing because oftentimes when we think about what Jesus does and his sacrifice on the cross and his commitment to his calling, you naturally envision someone who's older. When in actuality, what you have in Jesus is a model of a man who is absolutely mature for his age, that he has a full awareness of what the Lord has called him to do. 
He is fully committed to completing the assignment on his life. He doesn't allow anything to get in the way. Imagine having that mindset and that level of maturity at 30. Imagine what you do with your life if you're able to live beyond 33 and yet you exhibit that same level of maturity that Christ did in his early 30s. I mean, it really does amaze me. For the first time, it really kind of dawned on me that Jesus was us, our age. That he, well, my age 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> um, that he's able to do something phenomenal with his life at the age of 30. How does he do it? Well, I know what someone's going to say. Someone say, well, you know, he's Jesus. He's the son of God. You know, he's supposed to work miracles. He's, he's different than us. He's not a normal young adult, right? He's, he's the, the, the son of God. He's holy. He walks on water. He turns water into wine. So obviously, you know, he's not like us. And that is where you're right and you're wrong. Because the one thing scripture teaches us and reminds us is that Jesus is just like you and me. That he's not superhuman. He's fully human. And the passage I read for you in Hebrews 5, if you go back one chapter and begin in chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews makes an argument that we don't have a Savior who is not like us, but one who was in all points tempted as we were, who lived like us, that Jesus experienced the same things we experienced, that his desires were the same, that he had the same young adult yearnings that we have as young adults, and that in his 30s he was not some superhuman, but rather he was human just like you and me. And so when you read through the Gospels, what you're going to see is a Jesus who gets hungry, a Jesus who gets frustrated, a Jesus who gets tired, a Jesus who takes offense, a Jesus who talks sharply to people, a Jesus who gets tempted, a Jesus who has some fits every now and then, if you look at it. I mean, we read it in sanctified language, but when Jesus gets to Jerusalem and he goes in the temple, the Bible says he takes a whip and begins to beat people out of the temple while he's turning tables over. That, that, <laughs> that doesn't kind of fit the image of the holiest of holy men that we know. Uh, but Jesus is just like you and I. And one of the things that we see in Jesus as he enters Jerusalem in his last week of life is we see some real milestones of maturation that help us understand how it was he was able to do what he did. What makes Jesus so special is that he matured, that there are some life lessons he learned early. He didn't wait till 35, 40, but God pressed them on him early so that by the time Jesus gets to Jerusalem, you see a young adult who is committed to doing the will and the work of God and will not be distracted. And so what I thought to do tonight is share with you from Scripture and from the life of Jesus some of those milestones of maturation, some of those moments that we see a Jesus who is fully matured at 33 and able to do a great work for the Lord to kind of set goals for us for our lives of how we ought to mature in the Lord and how that helps us to fulfill God's call, God's assignment, and God's work on our lives. I've got a handful of them. We're going to try to get them out in the next 20 or so minutes. Uh, the first thing I want to share with you about this maturation of Jesus, this uh, model of a man who has matured uh, in his young adult years, is that Jesus is not dependent upon the applause of the approval of others. By the time he gets to Jerusalem, you see a man who is not dependent upon the applause or the approval of others. Follow, if you will, the life of Jesus. At the height of his ministry, when he feeds 5,000, that's only counting the men. And so one could argue that at some moment, there are almost 10,000 people at the feet of Jesus watching and worshiping him. How easy it is to buy into a crowd like that and believe that that crowd confirms who you are in Christ. But notice that by the time he gets to Jerusalem, Number one, a few things, that the closer he gets to the cross, notice that the crowd begins to dwindle, right? If you follow the life of Jesus, you'll see that the Bible uses this specific language, that there was a multitude, there was a crowd, there were the disciples, there were the 12, then there were the three, and by the time he gets to the cross, there's only one. So the closer you get to fulfilling God's purpose in your life, you ought to just assume that the crowd is always going to be decreased. When Jesus enters Jerusalem, 
there's a crowd gathered together, and you know this, they're crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and Jesus never responds to them. And when he gets to Pilate's court, there's another crowd that hollers, crucify him, and he doesn't respond to them either. Here is a Jesus who is neither deceived by the applause of people, nor is he detoured by the criticism of people. That he can have on one hand a crowd who's saying, yay, Jesus, and on the other side having a crowd saying, kill him, kill him. And Jesus is not deterred because he has not rooted his identity in the approval or the applause of people. He does not care whether you like him or you hate him. He does not care whether you appreciate him or whether you reject him. He has formed an independent identity that is not connected to whether people receive him or whether people reject him. Now let me tell you why that's important. Because many people in life have an undercover addiction to approval and can't handle criticism. Many people in life are addicted to a crowd affirming them and they can't operate when they're being criticized. And what we see in Jesus is a model of a man who's able to be effective regardless of whether he's recognized or approved. Hear me, you will never land in your place of maturity and fulfillment in life if you need the approval of others to validate the effort and energy you put in to the work that you do. At a certain point, you've got to do it because you believe that's what God has called you to do, that's what God has created you to do, that's what you are gifted to do. And you don't need a trophy in order to do what you've been called to do. So many people are older and still living in kindergarten where they need a sticker, they need a check plus, they need somebody to clap, they need someone to send a letter to your mama saying you did a good job, today was a good day. No, at a certain point, you've got to reach that place where the applause nor the criticism deter you from who you believe God has called you to be. Criticism. It's one of the toughest things for people to learn to live with. And by now, at this stage in life, you ought to know that everyone doesn't like you. There are people who will dislike you and don't know you. Right? Have no clue who you are, what you're able to do. And that's why I hold on to um, two things that my dad said to me. I pass them on to you in Twitter form. Uh, he said, number one, you're never as good as people say you are, and you're never as bad as you think you are. You're never as good as people say you are. You're never as bad as people say you are. I mean, as you say, as you believe you are. That's number one. The second thing he told me that I hold on to is that you always have to judge what you hear by who said it. Right? So there's some people whose criticism of you really shouldn't penetrate your skin at all because you know who they are. They mean nothing. Their opinion is invalid. Let me tell you something. If someone doesn't get along with their mama, they ain't going to get along with you. Okay. And you got to be careful of allowing people to project their own stuff on you because they can't deal with it in their own life. And so their unhappiness, their frustration, their insecurity, they vented this criticism towards you, and then you're silly enough to allow it to keep you up at night. When in actuality, what Jesus shows us is one of the signs of maturing is that you reach a place where you really don't care what people think about you. Now, it's not easy. It's not easy. We like people to like us. But the maturity that Christ exhibits is one who's not dependent upon applause or approval. Don't be so connected to what people say about you. As you mature, you reach a place where faithfulness is more important than approval. That as long as I know I've done what God called me to do, that I can lay down and rest at night. Others may not receive it. Others may not like it. It may not be popular. I may not be rewarded for it. But I know that I've been faithful to what God called me to be. So the first step of maturation in Jesus is a brother who's not dependent upon the approval or the applause of others. Secondly, notice that when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, more than at any other time in his ministry, he sits down with his disciples and has some real talk with them. He lets them know he's going to die. He begins to prophesy to them about how things are going to go down. He reminds them that troubling days will come after he's gone. 
He reminds them that they've got to be faithful. He tells them to stay together in the upper room. Jesus says a lot of things to the disciples in Jerusalem when he's getting ready to die that he has not shared heretofore. Heretofore, they've kind of gotten the perception that ministry is grand and glorious, that there's crowds, that there are miracles, that there are feedings, that they're going to be used in magnificent ways. And now here comes the hard part. And Jesus sets down and shares with them some things they would rather not hear. As a matter of fact, when he tells Peter, Peter's like, oh, no, if you read it, Peter tells Jesus, there's no way I'm going to let you die on the cross. I will go with you and I will die for you. And Jesus looks and laughs at him and says, you're the last one I can count on. <laughs> and let me tell you how this is going to go down. Uh, you will deny me three times before the sun even rises. And the second level of maturation that I see in Jesus, and this is one the Lord has really been working in my life on, He's not afraid of difficult conversations. He's not afraid of having conversations that need to be had. Hear me. Any relationship you're in that demands or requires emotional constipation is not of the Lord. If I've got to bottle up the emotions I feel and cannot express them, that is not the will of the Lord for me. It is not God's calling for you to be connected to people with whom you feel either offense or wounds or any type of way, and you cannot share that with them. And avoidance will never lead to deliverance. If you avoid the conversation, trust me, it usually gets worse. And I have found out the hard way, it is much better to tell you no and hurt your feelings on the front end than for me to say yes to something I know I should have said no to, and a year later, the conversation's got to get real ugly because now I'm feeling some kind of way because I've sacrificed my own emotional well-being. You cannot sacrifice your emotional well-being to protect the feelings of others. Sometimes difficult conversations are absolutely necessary for your health and the health of a relationship. They've got to be able to have that talk people would rather not talk about. And if you're engaged in someone, I mean, either as a friend or even romantically, and you all cannot have that conversation, that's probably a sign of a relationship you don't need to be in. You've got to be able to express yourself. Now, that's the easy part, initiating the difficult conversation. What also is a sign of maturity is that you can receive it that someone can bring to you some things that you've done that hurt them and you receive that. Many of us, the minute a difficult conversation begins, our defensive walls go up. And in counseling with couples all the time, I see so many bad communication patterns that prevent people from having a difficult conversation. Let me, let me share with you a few things that happen and that let you know that this relationship is breaking down. Number one, I call it the tit for tat. Right? So when someone brings to you something you've done, your response is to tell them something they've done, and then they're going to tell you something else you did, and then you're going to tell them something else they did, because now y'all are going back and forth. You ain't trying to resolve it. You're just trying to remind them, well, you messed up too. Right? And so it's this tit for tat going back and forth. Tit for tat leads to what I call emotional gumbo. Do you know what gumbo is? It's a dish where you just throw anything in you got in the house. And that happens a lot with people who can't receive difficult conversations. Rather than dealing with the issue that's been brought to the table, they start adding all the other stuff that they should have brought up when it bothered them, but because they were afraid of difficult conversation, they didn't, so they wait for you to open the door to something that displeased you, for them to now throw in all the stuff, and now y'all don't get anything done because she wanted to talk about the fact that you forgot her birthday, and now you bringing up the fact that she talked to a girlfriend too long, and now she's reminding you of how you hung out with your friends, and now you're talking about how she spent this kind of money, and everything's being thrown in, and nothing's being resolved. Because when it bothers you, you ought to raise it. Don't hold on to it and then wait for him or her to raise an issue and then you throw up all your stuff. Okay? And the third thing I've found that happens that prevents people from having positive conversations with difficult conversations are those who don't know how to apologize. Okay. Hear me. This, this, ooh, how many of y'all in a relationship right now? A relationship, if you're in a relationship, go on. I know, come on, just be honest about it. Just, mm, mm, mm. Whoa. 
Oh, y'all ain't no good. Y'all ain't no good. Camera ain't going on me tonight. Um, um, in a relationship, a relationship when you really do care about someone, when an offense has been brought to you, you have to know that if your first response is not an apology for the offense, the conversation is going to go sideways. Okay. Hear, hear me, please write this down. An explanation is not an apology. Just gonna say it again. An explanation is not an apology. Now, an explanation may be necessary, but when the explanation precedes the apology, the apology won't be received. Say it again. If the explanation precedes the apology, the apology won't be received. What they really want to hear is you say, I'm sorry I hurt you. Now, if you allow me to explain what I did so that you know it was not malicious, that's fine. But if the first words out of your mouth are an explanation and not an apology, the walls already go up, which shows that you're not able to receive a difficult conversation, which sends a message to me that your being right is more important than me being hurt. And when that's communicated, then my walls go up. Okay? So I need to know that how I feel matters to you more than you defending your action. Okay? So what we see in Jesus is, one, a brother who's not addicted to applause or approval. We see a brother who's able to have difficult conversation. Number three, I told you I want to move fast tonight. As you look at Jesus in Jerusalem, you're going to find that Jesus has trouble Big trouble with two disciples, Judas and, okay, try, try again. <laughs> he has trouble with Judas and, Judas betrays him. Peter denies him. So the question I would ask you just mentally, it's, it's a rhetorical question, which one is worse? To betray me or to deny that you know me? Both of them hurt. They're equally offensive. Notice, however, that with Peter, Jesus speaks about how he's going to be reconciled. He tells Peter, you're going to fall, but when you come back, strengthen your brothers. But with Judas, he just lets Judas go. Jesus says, in the upper room, when Judas is washing his hands in the bowl, Jesus says, the one who's dipping his hand in the dish is going to betray me. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it gets no clear. And then to make matters worse, Judas gets up and leaves. Leaves the upper room. Everybody knows it's about to go down. And notice, Jesus never tried to stop Judas. He never told Judas about coming back. It's almost as if Jesus looks at Judas and Peter and watch this, makes a decision that I'll fight to keep Peter, but I'll let Judas go. Because one of the signs of the maturation of Jesus is that he has discernment of who is ordained to be in his life and who the Lord has sent away from him. Ooh, we. Hear me. The older you get, the more you recognize some folk are like Judas. And hear me, God will oftentimes orchestrate a betrayal to set up a breakup. God will orchestrate the betrayal in order to initiate the breakup. Because this is not what he's ordained. And I've oftentimes said that walking with God is kind of like riding on a bus. At every stop, some folk get on, and some folk get off. And here's what I love about Jesus. Here's what makes him mature. When he realizes that losing people is part of the process of getting closer to your destiny. You cannot get to the destiny God has for you with a crowd of people. You don't believe that? Just ask Gideon. Gideon wanted to take 3,000, 30,000. And the Lord says, no, you only need 300. You can't fulfill this battle with too many people. You can't get to your destiny with a whole crowd. And here's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't cry about losing Judas. 
He doesn't try to win Judas back. Doesn't write a letter. He doesn't need closure. <laughs> because <laughs> I just need to know why, why you don't want to be with me. Just, just help me understand. What did I do wrong? The minute the enemy of righteousness knows you need closure to move on, it's the one thing you'll never get. There may never be a satisfactory answer. I mean, what can, what can someone really say that help close the door? Okay, all right, now, now, now listen, I'm equal opportunity. I'm equal opportunity, but I've, I've had to, just by nature of church, I've had to deal with and speak with more sisters and brothers. So it is fruitless to ask what she has that you don't. That... Here, here, real, real life, Marcia can test. I've, I've had this happen about three times since I've been here. Long-term relationship, y'all together three, four years, didn't want to get married, broke up with you, and got married three months later to another sister, right? So now you feel in some kind of way, like, what she got that I don't? That's, what, 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 what's that going to mean? What, what answer can he give you that you're going to accept that helps you close the door? <laughs> There comes a moment in the maturing process when I recognize that just because something is good doesn't mean it's ordained. And just because it's enjoyable doesn't mean that God has said it should be forever. And when the Lord gives you clear sign that something is over, listen, if the betrayal wasn't enough to make you walk away, right? if finding out there Judas isn't enough to make you wash your hands of it, I found out in my own life, sometimes God has to let it get ugly in order for you to get out, right? That God will orchestrate a betrayal to initiate a breakup. And one of the signs that you mature is that you're okay with losing people along the journey because everyone's not made for you. Everyone can't help you. Everyone isn't ordained by God to add to your life. Number four. So we've got, he's not addicted to applause and approval. We got number two, what was number two? All right, that he's not afraid of difficult conversations. Number three, he's not afraid of losing people. Number four, when Jesus gets into Jerusalem, notice that we hear from him a level of, a level of expression of pain and fear that we've not heard before. So when he's in the garden of Gethsemane, he says, Lord, listen, if there's any way possible, I don't want to do this. I don't want to die. Now, now realize that's not the Jesus we've seen prior to Jerusalem. The Jesus we've seen prior to Jerusalem is, come on, we got to go to Jerusalem. We got work to do. The Lord has an assignment on my life. Then he gets there. Lord, I don't want to do this. And then on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's a level of honest expression that we need to hear from Jesus. Because what we see in him, number four, is a man who's able to be honest with himself about his feelings. Then this, when he says, I'd rather not do this than prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's not with the 12, he's left nine of them, well, uh, eight of them, because Judas isn't with them. He's left eight outside. He's brought Peter, James, and John into the garden. And then the Bible says he goes further away from them to pray by himself. And it's in that private moment that Jesus says to the Lord, I don't want to do this. I'm afraid. Now, I may not share that with Peter, James, and John. I may not share that around Matthew and Bartholomew and Thaddeus. But I will be honest in this moment with myself and with the Lord that there's some things I don't like. 
And one of the greatest things we can do as we grow and mature in life is learn to be honest with ourselves. Hear me, the greatest damage done to you in life is never by the lies other people tell you. It's by the lies you tell yourself, of convincing yourself that something ain't what it is and is what it ain't. And not being able to be honest in a moment when you're alone with the Lord about how you truly feel. What I like about Jesus is that he's able to have that moment in prayer with the Lord. Every time Jesus expresses it, he's praying, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He's talking to God. Oh, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He's in a prayer moment. Beloved, that's one of the reasons why your prayer life is so critical, because your prayer life is one of the only places where you are forced to be authentic and cannot pretend to be anything you are not, and you cannot lie because you're standing before the one who knows everything about you. Your prayer life is critical because it creates that moment where for at least one moment in your day, you're going to be honest with yourself and with the Lord about how you truly feel. And if you can't be honest with those feelings, you'll never be able to express them fully with others. You'll never be able to be functional because you've not had that moment of honesty that comes in our prayer life. Now, what is important about Jesus is that he expresses those emotions, but notice he still goes to the cross. You know, I began rereading the life of Jesus during this Holy Week, and it's amazing to me, Marcia, that at no point is he forced to go to the cross. I mean, that there's, there are no angels that bind him. It seemed to me, like, and I, that's why y'all be glad I'm not Jesus, because if I'm in the garden and I know Judas is going to get the soldiers, I'm out, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> you go look for me and I'll be gone. Um, yo, let's go back to Bethany, amen. <laughs> we just go and hang out in Ephraim and Manasseh. Why don't we go to hang out in Egypt for a little bit? Because uh, I'm not doing it. You know? But with the choice he has, Watch what happens. He chooses not to act on the emotions or the feelings of fear, but rather on the fact that this is what God has called him to do. One of the great signs of maturity in life is when you can be honest with yourself about your emotions, but still check your emotions with fact. Let me say that again. I can be honest about how I feel, but I don't allow how I feel to outrule my sensibilities. Everybody knows someone who acted a fool on their feelings and didn't temper them with fact. And what we see in Jesus is a brother who says, listen, I've got these emotions, I'm afraid, I don't want to do this, but the fact of the matter is this is what God has called me to do, and so I'm going to allow my fact to override my feelings. The truth has to override how I feel. And what Jesus is able to do and I preached this in a sermon a, a, a few months ago. He's able to press pause between what he feels and what he does. Many of the people you know who've gotten in a whole lot of trouble in life get in trouble because they don't have a pause button. They feel and they act. And one of the signs of maturity is that you feel, but then you also press pause and you don't act because I don't need this case coming up and messing up my government clearance. <laughs> right? 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 Like, uh-uh, no. Nah. I ain't gonna let this joker cause me to lose my job. Right? That, that there's a pause between typing it out and sending it. Right? Sometimes you just ought to hit save. <laughs> and feel better that you get it out your system but you don't hit sin. Because when you don't have that pause button, you really wind up damaging yourself. I would suggest to you, in my own little statistical analysis, that suggests you about 90% of the people in jail are there because they couldn't press pause. That they had these feelings that took over them, and rather than pausing and dealing with fact, they went out and acted on feeling, and that feeling got them in trouble. Jesus presses this pause button. He doesn't allow his emotions to take over him. And notice that every time he shares these feelings, it's in a private conversation with God. One of the things I want to share with you about this emotional stability and not allowing feelings to take over you is that Jesus understands there's certain aspects of my personal life I don't live in the public eye. The part of being mature is to realize that everything I feel, I don't share with the world. 
I don't post everything that's going on in my heart. It is an emotionally immature person that wants to live out their emotional well-being through social media. That part of maturing is recognize that there's some things I post and there's some things I just talk to the Lord about. I'm too grown to get in a fight with someone on Facebook. I'm too old to be posting all my stuff on Twitter. Okay? I've grown too much for me to be taking, a, well, as a dude, you know, girls are different, but dudes with a thousand selfies, something wrong, something wrong. <laughs> something, something. Something. How I guard my public space changes as I grow older. That there's certain things the public should know, there's certain things that really is no one's business. Oh, you know, I, I get in a lot of trouble for being transparent. Um, and I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a hit on this, uh, but, but I'm, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be real with you because it's a life lesson, a real life lesson. You all know that recently I had to endure one of the most horrible situations in life and that's going through a divorce. Um, I, I do my best now to try to advocate for marriages to remain together because divorce is a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. I wouldn't recommend it for anyone. Uh, by the grace of God, three years afterwards, I'm healed. Uh, she and I are well. We're parenting together. So I thank God just for the healing. But it was a horrible thing. And going through it, part of what made it horrible is pastoring a church. Right? Because this is the only profession in the world where people feel they have a right to know what's going on in your personal life. I said, if I was an athlete, it wouldn't matter. You know, if I worked for UPS, it wouldn't matter. But because I preach, everyone feels they have the right to know. And one thing I was adamant about that I heard the Lord say to me was that to keep this private. This was a private matter between me and my former wife that it wasn't anybody's business. And, and so what I intentionally did was I never addressed it. I never, ever spoke about causality because it's really no one's business. It's no one's business. It's a private matter between me and my ex-wife. And... What happens when you don't give information is that the devil creates misinformation, right? And so it wasn't from the membership. It was people outside the membership rumoring, oh, I heard that baby is this. I heard he got caught in this kind of affair. You know, I even heard, you know, uh, that he was gay. And I was like, look, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> I may have many problems, <laughs> but I promise you I ain't gay. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody just, you know, chiming in on all this stuff. And, you know, I'm telling you, it's, it's a horrible experience to have your private stuff be put in public, in a public space. Um, when, I'm going to tell you, worst day of my life, worst day of my life. Um, some of you all saw it. Uh, a blogger got a hold of the divorce and decided to throw all this stuff out there. And people chiming in who don't even go to the church don't even know the pastor, making all these comments. You know, most, most of it was a lot of haters. See, I told you, all, they all them preachers the same, and all the women just going there for the past, yada, all this stuff. And so my son, um, Howard John, we call him Deuce, is in fourth grade at the time, and they're teaching them how to do research papers and how to research correctly. And the assignment was to Google his name, right? So he Googles Howard John Wesley. Bam. That was the worst day of my life. And it only convinced me even more that there's some private stuff you just can't live out in public. Because you'll be chasing it down all your life. And you can't prove a blogger wrong. What, what would I say to defend myself? How could I? Funny story, Terrence, a, a, mem a former member who left because of the divorce uh, came up one day I said, Pastor, you know, I need you to give an account for what's happened. Um, we want, oh, you know, I, 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 I'm going to tell you all a true story. Not, you're like, it's like, all right, I, you know what, and I appreciate the fact that you want to meet with me one-on-one. -on -one. I respect that. You have a concern, you have an issue, come to me as an individual. I don't want to hear from her what you said. Come to me. So he comes and he says, listen, you know, I don't believe in divorce, I don't believe it's biblical, um, you need to explain to me, you know, what happened, what's the cause of it. And I said, all right, yeah, I get it. Um, I said, do me a favor. And this is a true story, y'all. Please, please, let me finish it before you throw something. I said, I said, did you make love to your wife this morning? He looked at me, 
I said, exactly, it's none of my business. <laughs> right, right? And what happened between me and my wife is none of your business. And when you prove to me you have the right to know, I'll share with you why. Okay? When you mature, as difficult as it is, you realize that I have to guard my personal life to a fault. That the public does not have the right to have access to know everything about you. Okay? There's some things you deal with between you and the Lord. You deal with it between you and that person. But you're not emotionally immature and you go out spreading and talking and throwing everything out there. Okay? There's certain things that just remain private. Okay? And Jesus recognizes that everything I feel, I don't share. He didn't share all of that with the disciples because even they didn't need to know. This is between him and God. And part of that growth process to recognize that I deal with God with this. And whatever the Lord's punishment is, whatever the Lord's response is, that's between me and God to deal with. But it's not for everyone to be involved with. And I'm grateful to God, I'll tell you, to be part of a congregation now that respects that. Um, I just ask for what everyone else would ask for in that situation. Let it be a private prayer moment, you know, that this is not something everyone has to be involved in. Um, and to be at a place where you can testify about that is really a sign of how gracious God has been and merciful and healed. I, I can't tell you how thankful I am uh, to be on the other side of the pain of it, to be rebuilding, uh, to have a very, very positive and productive relationship with my ex-wife on the sake of our children, and to simply being a healthy and a happy and a holy place. Um, but it, it was real ugly for a moment. Um, and trying to live your personal life in public is really an immature thing to do. Learn to keep some things private. Learn to keep some things private. Number five. Notice that when Jesus does go to the garden to pray, he doesn't go alone. He takes Peter, James, and John with him. Now, you should know that those are the inner three. Those are the, those are the tightest of the disciples of Jesus, Peter, James, and John. They're known as the inner circle. And one of the things that I love about Jesus is that he recognizes when he needs some help. He recognizes that this is too much for me to bear by myself, and although I can't count on all 12, I am going to count on Peter, James, and John. Because one of the signs of maturing is to know when you need some help, to know when you can't figure it out by yourself, to know when a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a therapist may be exactly what you need. You just thought of somebody right now. Yes, Jesus. That there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that you need some help. Everybody needs somebody sometime. Everybody needs somebody. And I, I just believe that in your life, you ought to have some people that fit in one of or multiple five categories. There, there are five categories of people you need in your life to remain balanced. Five categories of people you need in your life to keep you even killed and to keep you pursuing God's call in your life. Let me give all five to you. Number one, you need what I call a celebrator. You need the person who reminds you that this is worthy of celebrating, that God's been good, that we ought to go out that you ought to have a good time, right? You can't just sit at home and be miserable all your days. You need, some, you, you need a celebrator, right? And all of us know that one person that like, probably like to do a little too much, but they're good for you. They're good for you. <laughs> they're good for you because they force you to get out of that isolated, depressed area. Like, Man, come on, let's, let's go out. Girl, we need to do this. Let's go to Jamaica. Let's go to Bahamas. Uh, time to go to Vegas. Hallelujah. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, man, that's the will of the Lord right there. Yes, Jesus. <laughs> Time to get out. Time to celebrate. You need a celebrator, someone who help, can look at your life and see those moments that you're allowing to go by and not rejoicing and remind you you ought to rejoice in this. You need a celebrator. Number two, you need a comforter. You need someone who helps comfort you in those moments when life has gotten rough. Same sex, opposite sex, just someone who doesn't allow you to cry by yourself. Someone who cares when you're hurt. Someone who wants to drop by. Someone who knows that you're feeling down and they're going to come and just sit with you. The great thing about a comforter is that they know the ministry of presence. They know what it's like to just come and sit. I ain't trying to explain it. Girl, I don't know why God let it happen, but here we are. I'm as confused as you. Let's pray. <laughs> you need a comforter. 
Number three, you need a challenger. I'm talking about specifically like in your professional life. You need someone in your life who's further up the road and challenges you to get where they are. You've heard me say it, and you probably heard others say it as well. If you're the smartest person in your circle, your circle's too small. You need people around you who are further up the road, who challenge you to be much more than you are right now. People who remind you that if you work hard at this, you can be successful. People who've lived it out. Right? Get yourself a challenger. Number four, get yourself a counselor. Someone whose wisdom you respect. Because one of the ways God speaks to us is through the wise counsel of others. And there ought to be someone in your life who you know is close enough to the Lord that when you ask them for wise counsel, you know that God is using them to speak to you. I have one in my life. This church knows him, Dr. John Borders. Uh, ever since my father passed, he is the only wise counselor I look to in my life. But I know that if I call John Borders and ask him a question, I almost instinctively know that whatever he shares with me, God's hand is on. And you need someone in your life like that who you instinctively know means you no harm, is not jealous of you, will not lead you down a road that God doesn't want you to be on, someone who fervently prays for you to be everything God called you to be. And I know that that's that brother in my life. Who is it in yours? Who's your counselor? Who do you go to for wise advice? And number five, you need a convictor. Yeah. Yeah, that one that... You, you ever had that person in your life, they, all, they, they always want to mention Jesus at the wrong time? <laughs> you know, you, you're getting ready to go out and do something, they're like, well, you know, I don't know if the Lord is, why you got to bring up the Lord on Friday? <laughs> you know? Someone who loves you too much to see you stray outside of God's will and God's plan. Literally a convictor. You all have heard me tell you time and again about the story of my friend Joe Cousin and how he was a convictor in my life in grad school when I had a party at my house and, all right, so I, you, you, I had a party at the house. All right, all right. <laughs> Cliff Note, sanctified version. Um, I had a party at, at, in my apartment, a bunch of grad students, and around about midnight, 1 o'clock, everybody started leaving, but one, one girl was sticking around. You know, she wasn't leaving. And I, mm, I think you are. You know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. You know, she's leaving. Everybody leaving, and she's sticking around, you know. And, but a few folk left, and... You know, I, we've been kicking it a little bit, so she's sticking around. I'm, I'm you know, yeah, yes, I was in seminary. You know, I mean, I'm like, <laughs> go get my oil, please. Go get my oil. Uh, and my friend Joe, like, wouldn't leave. He kept staying there. And, you know, I'm trying to give him the yo. Hey, Joe. <laughs> All right, man. Right on, brother. Uh, and he wouldn't leave. I mean, he just stayed, and then she left. And I was like, Joe. He was like, man, I couldn't let you do that. And to this day, I will call him and thank him for that. Because he knew, look, you don't need to ruin your anointing over that. I didn't want to hear it in that moment. <laughs> but you need a convictor, someone who is serious about your walk with the Lord even when you're not. Celebrate a comforter, challenger, counselor, convictor. Jesus knows when he needs help. You need those people in your life. Number six, and I'm going to stop on this one. It is amazing to me that when Jesus is on trial, you got to know he has um, a couple of trials that go back and forth from Herod to Pilate to Herod to Pilate again. And in those trials, notice how very little Jesus says. When he has an opportunity to defend and define himself, he says nothing. Because he realizes, finally, a moment of maturation, I don't have to prove myself to everybody. That Jesus embraced the ministry of silence. Pilate says to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' response is, if that's what you want to say. Here's what I love about Jesus. He, in essence, looks at Pilate and says, you can think of me what you want to think, and I'm not going to try to disprove what you think. 
because you cannot allow other people's opinions and delusions to become the reality you address. The people create a world that may not be based on your reality, and if they jump into it and assume certain things, you are foolish and immature to think you're gonna jump in someone's delusional world and get them to understand you better in the reality that is not real. I don't feel a need to defend myself to people who have a delusional opinion of who I am. You can't defend yourself to everyone, nor do you have to prove yourself to everyone. There's certain people, you gotta treat them with the ministry of silence. They get no response. Because the more you respond to it, the more you give life to it. Some people want a response even if it's an argument. And sometimes the best thing you can do is just choose not to get in the argument, not to let them push your button, not to let them get you hot and bothered, but to simply decide, I am not going to engage in this. You get no response from me. Jesus proves the ministry of silence is sometimes necessary. That's how you remain in control of your emotional well-being. I'm going to close with an illustration, and it's, it um, comes from a brother who's not that holy, um, but um, how many of y'all, y'all remember Mike Tyson back in the 90s? I mean, the pre-tattooed Mike Tyson? Mike, Mike in the 90s was, was a bad boy. I mean, really, if, if you see Mike's fights, we, we used to buy them on pay-per-view just to see how short they were going to be. You know, they, um, they, they once did a, a measurement of, of Mike Tyson's uh, cross, with his, I think it was his right cross, like the, the pound per square inch impact, and Mike would hit you harder than someone taking a baseball bat and swinging it. That's how strong Mike's punch was. So if he hit you once in the body, it was pretty much over. Mike was a bad boy. And you all remember, well, some of you may, Mike was out one night at a club. He got in this fight with a former boxer named Mitch Green. Right? Mitch Green was this, Greensboro had this long jerry curl. It was, you know, it was 90s, it was 90s. And Mitch and Mike got in this fight at the club. And when they interviewed Mitch Green, like, a, like outside the club, Mitch put on sunglasses, but you could still see how swollen his eye was from where Mike hit him, right? So Mitch is in front of the camera, and Mitch is talking about, look, look, Mike Tyson snuck me. You know, it wasn't a fair fight. We were up in the club. I didn't see it coming. He hit me from the backside. And this is what Mitch kept saying. He said, listen, I want Mike Tyson in the ring. I'm a former boxer. I want Mike in the ring. If I get Mike in the ring for a battle for the heavyweight championship, I know I can beat Mike. If it's a fair fight, I'm going to beat Mike. I want Mike Tyson in the ring. And Mike Tyson never took the fight. When they interviewed Mike on the 30 for 30, this is what Mike said. The interviewer asked him about the Mitch Green. He said, you remember the fight with Mitch Green at the club? You remember how Mitch Green kept saying it wasn't a fair fight? Mitch Green kept saying he wanted you in the ring. This is what Mike Tyson said in one of the few moments of sanity I've ever heard him speak. <laughs> Mike Tyson said, I was the heavyweight champion of the world. It's only a fight if I wanted to be one. It's only a fight if I step in the ring. Mitch only gets a fight if I choose to let him fight me. And one of the ways you show that you wear the belt over your life and your emotions and your well-being is when you have that same kind of moment when you declare there's some people I don't fight with because it's not a fight unless I choose to make it one. I play that out in pastoring all the time. Everything isn't cozy and, and cuddly in church. Sometimes people have different opinion and stand against a vision, want to do different things. And those around me, pastor, why don't you fight that and why don't you tell them off? Because I'm the pastor. It's only a fight if I want it to be one. They can think what they want. They can say what they want. They only get more attention if I jump in the ring. So I decide to stay out of it because it's not a fight. And there's certain people they're not worthy of you getting in the ring with. There's certain people who've proven they are delusional and need help. And they're not worthy of you getting in the ring with. There's some people that have issues and problems they are not worthy of you getting in the ring with. There's some people that need to get right with the Lord and there's, no worthy of, there's not worthy of you getting in the ring with. And I want to encourage you from the life of Jesus to learn when it's worthy to battle, when it's worthy to give them the ministry of silence because everybody's not worthy of you. He changed the world at 33. And I believe that if we practice some of those principles of maturation in our own life, 
We'll change our own world too at 30, 40, whatever it may be.